You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, and it's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, or any other places that you get your podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And I always remind my listeners that I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or as you can see in the background, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. So let me get on with the show and introduce you to my guest. It's always the highlight of my weekly podcast as my guest, no exception this week. Dr. Bob Saul, a pediatrician and medical geneticist, Robert Saul, MD, has been guiding parents in their children's physical, behavioral, and mental care for over 40 years. He is a professor of pediatrics emeritus, and Dr. Bob Saul developed the Parental Awareness Threshold, a simple framework that guides parents and guardians to actively parent with self-awareness, empathy, and compassion. Parents who use this framework create a healthy environment where children learn to build safe, stable, and nurturing relationships, as well as exhibit love and respect others in their community. Dr. Bob Saul, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is a, this is a real pleasure for me. Excellent. Excellent. I'm very excited to have you here. And I know that it, as you mentioned, or as I mentioned too, that you've done a lot of neat things around uh, the children's aspect and pediatrics, and we're going to get to that in a little bit, but, but I always start off for kind of a context of how I met somebody. Tell the listeners how you and I met. Well, we met through the uh, Cornelia Stephanie Media Group that was, uh, was excited to have a podcast with uh, Cornelia. Then I uh, joined the group, uh, and then this delightful young man, uh, David George Brooke, was there and we've uh, connected since. Yeah, no, that's, it's really true. And I remember thinking, not only with, oh, he seems like a cool guy, this Dr. Saul, Dr. Bob, as I like to call him, but also, and for some reason on that network of all those people, it was about 90% women. So it was nice to get another, uh, another man in the mix, so to speak, and so on. So, so what I like to do is kind of, we're going to talk about the parental awareness threshold and some of the different things that you did which I think will be really interesting for the listeners. But what I like to do is kind of back up and not the entire story from grade school or junior high, but maybe college kind of going forward. Talk a little bit about the journey that Dr. Bob was on and maybe where it started and maybe where you were headed and if you changed direction along the way and and how you ultimately ended up being the pediatrician that you are. Well, that's a good question. And what I found in uh, college uh, was that my first wife and I were foster parents. Foster mm. parents were children with disabilities. We did that for about 12, 18 months. Uh, then medical school rigors took over. But in medical school, I wanted to do most everything. But then finally, I realized that pediatrics is where I wanted to go. So I went to Duke University to do my after, excuse me, went to Colorado to do my medical school, then went to Duke to do my pediatric training and then moved to South Carolina and did medical genetics training. Wow. Doing those things, I got, you know, I was gung-ho. I was ready to be the best darn doctor, darn doctor you could be. I was going to be do everything that I was supposed to do from a standpoint of pediatrics, genetics, and I was going to learn everything. This was very much a burgeoning, exciting, developing field in medical genetics. But after about 14 years, I found out that I, I felt like I wasn't paying back to the community. I was thriving as a professional in the community, but I asked myself, what have I done to pay back to the community? I heard at the same time, I heard a talk from a healthcare futurist 
who said 12 words that have had a profound impact on me ever since. And it's been a 30 year journey after I heard those 12 words. For anything that happens in the community, I am the problem, I am the solution, I am the resource. Mm. So what that means is for anything that happens in the community, I have to take personal ownership in it. It's not their drug problem. It's not their teenage pregnancy problem. It's, their, it's not their gun violence problem. It has to be mine. And I need to be part of the solution. And to do that, I need to devote my resources to it. And it was, I am the problem. I am the solution. And then well, I am the resource. I am the resource too. Well, that's really neat. And, and just, I, I love that. As you said, the 12 words too, uh, gosh, in, I've learned too, if you want to help yourself, help other people. It's one of the things I've learned, one of the basic mantras of life. But I want to go back a little bit to the, you mentioned in the beginning, your first wife were foster parents. Talk about, I don't know if the average listener, viewer of this would have had that experience as a foster parent, but talk a little bit about how that was for you. Because I've always admired people greatly uh, that have foster children and take on somebody else's children and they're not their own and, and yet they treat them as well they as much as they would their own children how was that experience for you that kind of got you going down that road and your wife obviously you, you two agreed on that as a course for you how what was that experience like well it was it was exhilarating and frustrating i mean these mm. uh, the uh, we had few children and again these were children that had significant disabilities the first child we had was a nine-year-old child that suffered from congenital rubella. So he had significant visual impairment, significant hearing impairment and cardiac disease. And when we took him into our house at nine years of age, he was not yet potty trained. Oh, wow. Uh, now, you know, taking a nine-year-old child to the grocery store uh, that's not yet potty trained can be quite a, can be quite a chore. Yeah. Uh, so we uh, took on that chore. Uh, it was a joint venture, uh, but it required probably a lot more work on my uh, first wife's part uh, than mine since I was actively engaged in college at the time. And it was, we got involved with some other foster parent families and saw that the trials and tribulations of taking care of uh, children that were not your own. I don't think I really understood the impact of being a foster parent then, like I do now, having cared for in a professional way, uh, children are in foster care and understand the significant impact uh, that they have and the problems that they, they are dealing with really on a lifelong basis. Mm. So it, it's what I did then was naive compared to what I know now. Oh, really? And so can you give me an example of some of those things that, because again, I think it's such a noble cause, but you think you were a little naive then. What were some of the things that kind of changed as your approach back then to say now when it came to the foster kids? Well, I think I did not know now how significant their isolation is. Oh, wow. Um, the, uh, there's a great book that was written about being a foster parent or about being a foster child called The City of One uh, by a, a woman that, was, that is now a child psychiatrist. Uh, she did not have disabilities, but at age nine, she was abandoned when her family died. Uh, and she was and she was picked up by some relative. So, excuse me, she was not picked up by some relatives. She thought she would. She was just thrown into the foster care system. Uh, and, you know, people try to provide care, but it's just not the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we try to provide as much nurturing as we can. And the the Department of Social Services is usually undermanned and poorly staffed. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of in terms of trying to provide that interface between where children go and the foster parent and the foster parents themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think earlier you mentioned that in the first 14 years of doing that. And as you went through your medical practice, your training, I should say, and how did the pediatrician piece come together? Because I'm always curious. I've met people that say since I was five years old, I wanted to be a doctor. I was 19 years old when I wanted to be a speaker, and it took me 45 years to ever get the guts to go out and become a speaker and leave all the other jobs that I had. So do you remember kind of the thought process back then? Was it something about kids that just always a soft spot or a soft spot or how that happened? Well, I think that brief period of being a foster parent for children with disabilities really sort of lit my, lit my fire. Mm -hmm. But again, when I got into medical school, I almost wanted to do everything. 
I mean, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a radiologist. I wanted to be an internist. Uh, I wanted to be a, uh, you name it. I almost wanted to be a, a, everything I could. But then I think it was that in the back of my mind, that process of having been cared for those children and see how much care they can need in the best of times and the worst of times that I really wanted to jump into that. At the same time, I was very much scientifically driven to understand a lot of basic science. And that's where medical genetics came into it. Uh, in 1979, when I went into medical genetics, it was very much at the forefront of the field of medical genetics. But I wanted to do both. I did, never wanted to get away from primary care. I just didn't want to do it all the time. And I think about the, the profession, the medical profession of such a it's like the foster care, such a noble profession. And you were talking about radiology and, and the different things that you were interested in. And as you think back, where, where did your motivation come from? Because that's, that's pretty, that's a high level of motivation, in my opinion. I want to not only do this, I want to do this. I want to see if I can do all these things in medical school. And where do you think that motivation came from for you? I think it was from, for, I think it was from my mother. Uh, my mother was a very unique individual. My parents divorced when I was young. My, my father was an alcoholic. There were significant issues there, but my mother was always there. When my parents divorced, I remember my mother saying, I just want you to be happy. I just want you to be happy. Fortunately for me, I didn't follow that advice. I followed her example, mm. uh, when, which, and her example was to care for others and do everything she could for other folks. Uh, so that put me in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. And then how did you find the experience? Because I think about like any of us, I've always prided myself in taking good care of myself. And that means going to the, for the full physical once a year and the little blood checkups twice a year and so forth. But how did you find the experience in the pediatric world where I would, I'm just guessing you don't get as much feedback from the child you get as you would an adult, but you do maybe from the parents. But as you started out in that practice, how did that differ from maybe what you thought it was going to be like? I don't think it was ever different than what I thought it was going to be like, because no. I, in, in medical school, I had good training in several pediatric rotations. Mm -hmm. I understood that <clears throat> in many ways, children aren't going to provide that specific feedback that maybe an adult might, uh, mm -hmm. but it really was a partnership. I mean, in, in, you know, in internal medicine, people caring for you and me, it's just the doctor and us. Uh, in pediatrics, it's the doctor, the child, and the, and the family, and the uh, and the parents. And that's what makes it an interesting uh, interactive experience. Well, and I would think too, uh, you always hear the term, at least I've heard the term over the years, bedside manner. And I would think, again, knowing the doctors I've known over the years and <clears throat> never went down that road myself, but I would just think, again, as a pediatrician, there's it's even a higher level of bedside manner maybe than some of the other uh, disciplines, just because you're dealing with these children. And of course, they have their parents, but some, as you said, the foster parents don't have their parents. But I, I just would think that would even be more of a requirement. Isn't that kind of true in terms of the, the way you treat that patient, which happens to be a child? Oh, I'd like to think so. That I, I think, it, in, you know, you have to come up with a unique way of interacting with children. You can't just come in with your white coat and your stethoscope and say, sit up on the table. Right. Uh, so using bird noises, asking silly questions, uh, interacting in, in different ways, and learning how to simplify one's language to get across the same information. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the same time, if you don't, if you can't give that information to the, to the parents, it's not going to get translated to what they need to do when they get home. Yeah. You know, there, there's an adage that's in medicine, but it's everywhere also. People don't really care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that really, that really holds certainly for, for uh, medical interactions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, whether it's the bedside manner, it's kind of like the communication piece almost across the board, the communication piece is probably the most important piece we all, we all have, whether it's our relationships or spouses or family or whatever is, if you can communicate at a good level and, and certainly, uh, some people are good at that and some aren't. So, so let's get back to your kind of journey as you went along and talk a little bit more about the later stages. I mean, I mentioned this parental awareness threshold as an example, but what were some of the later things that came up as you went down kind of the, you know, into your 30s and 40s and, and that as far as part of the practice, how that evolved? 
So after I heard those, those 12 words, I am the problem, I am the solution, I am the resource, I went to the community and said, put me in coach, I'm ready. I'm mm. ready, ready to do some good work. And I got involved in a variety of things, chamber of commerce, a variety of things, actually maybe even smugly so that I was doing such good work. Mm. And then April 20, 1999, two kids, two teenagers walk into a high school, massacre 13 people and kill themselves. You and I know that as Columbine. Yep. That, that had a profound impact on me. And I cannot tell you why specifically. Granted, I went to high school, college, and medical school in Colorado, but that I had no specific attachment to that institution. But I could not shake that, that issue. I asked myself, could that happen in my community? And the answer was yes. What have I done to prevent that sort of thing from happening? And the answer was not enough. Wow. So I put my put pencil to paper. Back then, we still did that, um, and wrote an article for the local newspaper. If you fast forward, what I did was I wrote, given that paradigm that we'll talk about, I wrote over 160 op-ed articles to the local newspaper wow. Wow. Uh, over a period of 12, 13 years, what each of us could do to make a difference. Wow. And what I ar articulated in that first article was what I call the five steps to community improvement. And those you know, that 12, 13 years of articles that I wrote are iterations of those five steps. What can we do to make a difference? And, and that's sort of, that's the basis of where I got, my first book was called My Children's Children, Raising Young Citizens in the Age of Columbine. Mm. And I'll be glad to articulate those five steps to you because I think that gives me the basis for where, we're, if we're gonna talk about conscious parenting later. Yeah, no, please do, that sounds great. For number one, learn to be the best parent you could be. Learn, parenting is a constant learning experience. I chose those words carefully. So learn to be the best parent you could be. Part of that, though, is everyone has different abilities. My ability to be the, quote, best parent my, I could be might be different than yours based on if you're a single parent, if, depending on your socioeconomic situation, depending on your intellectual abilities. So there are a variety of things. So my job is to help enable people, empower people to be the best parent they could be. Early on in my career, people oftentimes came to the office, you know, what should I do, doc? And so I would tell them. I realized after a significant period of time, my job was not to tell them, but to help them and oftentimes to gently peer behind the curtain mm -hmm. and see what was going on and see how I could help them based on their circumstances, not based on my perception of their, of their circumstances. Wow. wow. So that's number one, learn to be the best parent you could be. Number <clears throat> two, get involved. And I had no specific formula there. You just need to get involved in your community, whether that's, you know, softball coach, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, volunteering at your church, at the food bank, get involved. Number three, stay involved. And mm. I think that's different. Uh, it's easy sometimes to get involved, but sustaining that involvement uh, can be difficult. Right. And, you know, the, the specific involvement might change, but you need to sustain involvement over a period of time. Right. Number four is the most intuitive, I think love for others, but it seems to be the most difficult in today's divisive society, where it seems to, where we have too much of us versus them shouting past each other. Yeah. And number five is this is where I've been on a real journey myself is forgiveness. I didn't realize when I wrote down about forgiveness, how difficult that was going to be over the period of my life to really understand what that is. And I'm not sure I'm, I'm still there yet. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad I'm on the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the initial guidance for that is from the great little book, Tuesdays with Maury uh, oh, yeah. by, Mitch, by Mitch Album. Yep. And, you know, to simplify Maury's idea about forgiveness, for, one is forgive yourself first for what you've been thinking or haven't been doing or what you've been about yourself. Give yourself some grace Two, forgive others. And three, do it now. Yeah, yeah. So those were the five steps that got me going, that put me on this introspective journey. 
And Dr. Bob, did you did you have a name like the five elements or the five? What is just the five steps or what did you call that? I called, I called them the five steps to community improvement. <clears throat> and that first book uh, is divided into diff the different sections about each of those each of the five steps. Uh, and the, the subtitle for the first book was Raising Young Citizens in the Age of Columbine. Because mm. to me, the point of, <clears throat> of parenting is raising your children to be good citizens. Right. My mother always, my mother, as I said, my mother said, I want you to be happy. I want you to be happy. I, and I said that to my first, son, my oldest son, when my first wife and I divorced, I said, son, I just want you to be happy. And as I've been on this journey, I realized I think I had that a little backwards. What I want him to be is to be a good citizen, yeah. care for others. Uh, and then happiness is the blissful side effect of that. Well, and that's a good point, a good citizen, because somebody could say they, they're happy and they go around shooting people and makes them happy or something, but that's not being a good citizen. So I, I kind of, I really like that. And I think that, you know, when you and I mentioned uh, before the show that uh, we're just about the same age and, and I think something that is really, and I'm, I want your comment, I want to go back also to April 20th, 1999 and get a comment from you on that as well. But, but first off, I think if I look back and I think about how we were raised and there's different, you mentioned socioeconomic things and there's different black versus white and minorities and there's just all these factors. But I always think one thing that didn't get enough credit or maybe discredit for what happened to the family unit is the divorce rate. Because I was born in 1950, as were you, and there were in the 50s and really a good part of the 60s, you did not hear the word divorce. That was not a word you heard. I mean, I remember somebody saying once in grade school, like somebody was like, what's, what's divorce? I mean, their parents aren't, they're not together. What can that be? And then by the 60s and gosh, by the 70s, where it became so prevalent, I mean, nowadays, if somebody tells me their parents or somebody still married, I got seriously, they're still together after all, because it became so common. But the, the sort of, however we want to put the blame, maybe there is no blame, but the destruction of the family unit, I think was such a big part of the problem that we had with all these lost children, if you will, uh, latchkey kids and, and single parents. And, and just, do you feel that was as big a factor as I do? Yes and no. I mean, I think, yes, the, the divorce rate has certainly increased, but I suspect there are a lot of very unhappy people that didn't divorce mm. because it wasn't socially acceptable. That's true. Uh, my, my mother was ostracized from her family when she proposed a divorce, but she was in a very abusive relationship and, yeah. and needed to move on. Um, so it's, it's, it's simplistic to say that it's just the divorce rate. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the other things that I, there's a, sociologist by the name of Robert Putnam, who published a book called Bowling Alone, and looks at social capital. And he looked at how social capital is really sort of disintegrated. And that maybe is a dramatic word. But if you look back in post-World War II, people were always gathering, doing things together. Uh, and he used, the, he used the analogy of bowling leagues. Uh, mm -hmm. People Bowling leagues were just sort of ubiquitous yeah. uh, back then. Um, and then as media television and other things came came along. And as we people started separating, maybe because some of that is also divorce, then there was this breaking up of social capital. And so I think it's a combination of, yeah. of, of some of the fabric of our society uh, that has led to some of the, the more overt uh, acceptance of expressions of dissatisfaction and the ability to move on. Well, and listening to you say that reminds me that, like so many things, it is a combination of many things. It's not just one thing that contribute to it, uh, as I mentioned, like the divorce rate or what have you. And I think women in the workplace was it, women deserve to make as much money as men, as much a bigger uh, opportunity to make money and to have a career as men do. But then also men a lot more again, kids at home with babysitters or nannies, or I never personally have under, quite understood the concept of a nanny is that you're going to have these children and then you're going to hire somebody else to raise them while you go off and make money to pay the person. And that's, that's more my opinion, but it just, it's interesting. And I, I take such pride in my two sons. And I know that uh, even though 
they lost their mother when they were four and 14. So they were pretty young and I raised them basically myself, but it still is, that's just what happened. And, and no, nothing's more important to me than those two young men. So it really makes a difference. But, but I want to just go back for a second and I almost kind of hesitate to ask it, but you mentioned when you said it all changed um, April 20th, 1999, Columbine. What is, especially from the Dr. Bob perspective, what, looking back with the perspective now of 23 years later, what other things can we take away from that maybe now that we couldn't have in the beginning, especially when you're talking about the five steps to community improvement and, and raising your children to be good citizens, which makes perfect mm -hmm. sense to me, but is there, are there newer lessons that could be taken away from the whole column? Because I know that kind of was technically the start of some of the, the school things, but that we can take away or lessons we can learn. Well, I mean, one of the, at the time, to, to me, the, one of the primary things was that the, the prevalence of hate uh, in our society and mm -hmm. the expressions of hate uh, and the inability to subvert hate. <clears throat> and I'm not saying just push it down and not let it come back up, uh, but, to al but to allow it to foment uh, and in some ways to accept it. Uh, even, you know, now in our political environment, uh, we hate this, we hate that. Uh, we might hate an idea, we might hate a behavior, but we should never hate the people. Right. Um, and then the other thing from the Columbine thing is, and I've, as I've read the books about the parents and the situation, it's that we just don't understand what's going on in people's lives. We're, we're sort of willingly accepting people being, I don't have to really get involved in their life because it'll be too complicated. Right. Uh, and I think that's to our own detriment. I mean, we, every time we hear of a, of a tragic situation of someone taking their life or someone doing something uh, despicable like homicide or other things like that, we said, I don't understand how those people can do that. Right. Well, we just haven't been willing to accept a significant view of what other people are going through. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to accept that because mental health has become such a, a crisis in our society and we're still not willing to deal with it. And we talk about health insurance, you know, if you got a heart problem, boom, we'll take care of that. Right. If, if you got a significant mental health problem, we'll take care of that, but we're going to cap that level of of, uh, of insurance. And, and rather than actually give you some person to person therapy, we think you can just take these, these antidepressants or these anti anxiety medicines. So true. And it's a combination of things that society really hasn't accepted uh, as we should to move on. Yeah, that's so true. So true. And I think, as I, I think and began back Oh, and by the way, so now did you have kids of your own or just foster kids? No, then I mean, again, we just had foster kids for 12, 18 months. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, then my, my first wife and I have a son and he's, okay. he's 43. He's 40, will be 44 this year. Oh, and my second wife and I have a, we have a 32 year old. Oh, okay. Great. So, and the reason I ask is because uh, certainly the foster children is a great experience. And then when you have the biological children, uh, as I mentioned, the, the two sons that I have, and we were talking about the prevalence of hate and getting, not getting involved in their lives. I think another thing for me that was not the, the end all be all, but really being aware of who they're hanging out with. And I think that has a lot to do with getting involved in their lives, just being aware of who their friends were. And, you know, there's good, good groups and bad groups of friends. And, but to your point too, back to the, be the best parent you can be. I love the five steps because I remember this experience when Connor, my younger son was Let's see, he would have been about seven or eight, I'd say. And he wanted to go for a play date to one of his friends. And so I I, I, don't, I think I went over there and introduced myself to the parents and looked at the house and met both the mom and the dad. And I'll bring Connor over tomorrow at three o'clock. It was something like that. And then I remember several months later, another friend of his wanted to come over to our house. And he's about the same age. And the doorbell rings. Here's a little kid and the car's driving off. They've never met me. <laughs> he just goes, hi, I'm here to see Connor. Don't you guys want to meet me? Don't you? I mean, and, and again, it just shows how different approaches can be. And, and I've also, again, I go back to the five steps to community improvement and starting with the next generation. And I've always felt, I know there's a lot of books out there, but there's something about 
all these things in life. I learned how to fly when I was in my late twenties and I had to go through all these different classes and instruction. And then you take your final exam and you go out with the chief pilot and all these different things. And we learn how to drive a car and, and yet to have parents or to be parents, you basically have to know how to have sex. And then a, a baby appears nine months later. And there technically isn't much of a manual that comes with that, even though there's you know been some books written, but I've always, it's the most important job raising the next generation and yet there really, in some ways, isn't a lot of formal education around that. Oh, you're absolutely right. And that's one of the tenets of the second book, Conscious Parenting, is there is no map. Parenting mm. is not an innate ability. It's a constant learning, learning experience. And you have to be on top of that. And, you know, that can be with your spouse. That can be with your grandparents. That can be with your educators. That can be with your doctors. But I think we need to do better in school with with teaching how to how to be a better parent. I remember when I was in school, we had a civics class. Um, we did not have sex education because that would have been too racy back then. Yep. The, uh, but uh, now they fortunately do. But if we have talks about sex uh, and about how to prevent venereal disease and how to uh, reproduce in a rational way, we certainly should be doing more in terms of parenting. There seems to be though this concern that you're going to tell me how to be a parent. Mm -hmm. That's not the whole point of early education of parenting is to expose you to the aspects of what it needs to be, what the vital elements of being a parent, much like they're not going to, you know, the whole point of education is to turn you into a well-rounded citizen. They're not going to tell you how to vote. That's a decision you're going to have to make on your own. Right. Uh, But there are some basic tenets of learning how to be a parent. That are that are very important going forward. And you make a you make a great point because you call them basic tenants. I think there's something about I've noticed parents when I'm observing in the grocery store, the mall, whatever it might be. Everybody thinks their kids are the best or they're the best parent, or at least it appears that way. And yet I've seen some parents swatting kids and doing some things that I just wanted to go inter, intervene. You know, just what are you doing? And this in something that was not appropriate way to take care of a little baby or a little child or something. And and but it's, it's always been there's something about it that's so special that just seems to put it in a different category than other things that we learn in life and where again we've got to get checked out and we got to get our certificate we got to get our license we've got all these things you have to do before we can you know do a job or whatever but uh you just said something that made me think of this it's just slightly off topic but it is one of my favorite questions literally of my entire life and so from your perspective, be it from the pediatrician or just in general, all the medical world that you've been in for so long, what is your opinion why people don't take better care of themselves? Oh, I don't know that I have a good answer, answer for that one for you. Um, the, I, I, again, I think it's some of that's early education mm-hmm. that, we, that we haven't understood that because we haven't provided the right examples. Mm-hmm. of that. Uh, now, unfortunately, you know, physical education is not even a significant requirement in a lot of schools oh, like it used right. to be when, when we were growing up. And the, and the right nu- nutrition is not presented. And, you know, the, we look back at our, our diets in terms of, you know, it was meatloaf on, on uh, Tuesday. Uh, it was, you know, hamburgers on Wednesday or whatever the elementary school menu is. And it didn't get any better going forward. And there was really no good uh, nutritional understanding about that. And, and putting the two, putting them together, putting yeah. nutrition, putting, you know, how to sort of take care of yourself mentally uh, and all of the other things that need to be, that need to, that need to be part of taking care of yourself to take care of others. Yeah. Let me jump in. Let me jump back for just a minute. What you're talking about that grocery store punishment, mm. uh, because I think that's a significant issue that I'd like to try, stress. Remember, <clears throat> sometimes people equate discipline to punish punishment. Mm. That's a that's a not equivalent uh, sign. Mm. The root word for discipline is disciple, which means to teach. So whenever we're dealing with abnormal behavior. We should be dealing with, we should be talking about how to turn this into a teaching moment, Mm -hmm. a teaching with love moment. Right. We do know that children that are physically abused are more likely to do the same when they get older. Mm -hmm. Now, I hear a lot of people tell me, oh, don't give me that namby-pamby 
stuff, Dr. Bob. Uh, my dad gave me a good whooping when I was growing up and it taught me a lesson. Well, depending on your circumstances and, and that, that might be okay, but the significant analogy is not everyone that smokes gets lung cancer, right. but it sure increases your risk. Mm -hmm. Not everyone that gets physically punishment, punished turns into a physical punisher, but it certainly increases your risk. And I don't want my parents taking that risk. Yeah. And it's not unusual for me to see in the office for a child that was maybe crying or acting up or wasn't doing what mom wanted them to do for mom to pop them. Mm -hmm. And it was difficult for me because that was, now I had to change gears and go into a significant, we really shouldn't be doing that mom ex yeah. explanation. Right. But it's one of the most important lessons we need to do is not to finish physically punish our children. Well, and I think you make a great point, too, that I could, you know, kind of compare to other things where it just feels like sometimes the, the pendulum, we've gone way too far, goes way to the left. And so then to counteract that, we go too far to the right and maybe there's a middle ground. And I think, uh, for instance, I was I remember being spanked. And again, in the 50s and 60s when I was growing up and and it wasn't like it was now. It's so different now, but it sure got the point across to me. I knew that, you know, just it worked out that I don't I'm not going to I don't want to get spanked again. So I'm going to behave and do what I'm supposed to do. But it's it's such an interesting because I feel sometimes we've gone too far the other direction. In fact, that might be a great segue when we talk about the parental awareness threshold. How do you kind of describe that? Because it's. It, it says actively parent with self-awareness, empathy, and compassion. How does that kind of kind of figure into this parental awareness threshold? Let me give you a little background to that. When I, when I changed jobs late in my career, I took over a job as a medical director of general pediatrics at an academic health center. Mm -hmm. uh, and they made me take another leadership course. And I rolled my eyes and said, okay, I'll do this. Um, and it was a, a paradigm called conscious leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and they talked about being conscious, being aware, being open, receptive, and ready to learn. Mm -hmm. And they talked about if you're unconscious, you're, you're closed, you're defensive, you're always right. And they talked about a line. And when you're above the line, you're open, receptive, and ready to learn. When you're below the line, you're closed, you're defensive, uh, and, and always right. And we've all been in that three o'clock meeting where we're just not talking and going, when is this thing going to be over? This mm -hmm. is so boring. I can't believe I'm, I'm here. Right. And the whole point of that conscious leadership is just be knowing where you were conscious. Okay. You're conscious and say, you know, I'm below the line. Mm -hmm. I can choose to stay there if I want to until, until the four o'clock bell rings. Right. right. Or I can say, I need to start listening more. I need to start being more interactive and more attentive. So the, the line in terms of consciousness to me very much translated to parenting. And I called it the parental awareness threshold. When you're above the parental awareness threshold, you're open, you're receptive, you're ready to learn, you're ready to be more interactive and attentive to your children. When you're below that, you're closed, you're defensive, because I said so, because I'm the parent. Mm. Uh, and we're human, we're, we're gonna be above and below that parental awareness threshold. Right. My point is, is the whole point of conscious parenting is a conscious awareness aware of where you are. Mm. You, you, and you're, at times you're going to say, you know, I'm really not paying attention here. I'm just, this is by rote. This is just a knee jerk reaction and I need to change. <clears throat> and part of that then is you need to understand the dyad. Where is the child developmentally? The child developmentally at two is very different than six, uh, than 10 than 16. So right. you need to understand where your child is. You can't just expect your two-year-old to pick up all the toys uh, and be and laugh about it. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, and you expect your 16-year-old to drive with care. Right. Uh, and so you have to understand where you are because at any particular time, say on a Monday morning, because of the stress of the week, uh, and what and all the things you have to get ready, you might respond to the same thing very differently than you would on Friday afternoon. Mm, yeah. So the conscious awareness of where you are as a parent is so critical and where the child is. And then that gets me into sort of 
in the you need to sort of be aware of what you are in the moment mm -hmm. or in retrospect in the moment i would i encourage people to pause assess and choose pause assess where you are assess the situation and choose a response and you might choose the wrong response and so hopefully in retrospect you can make it make a change with that a yeah. quick a quick personal example when my son was about seven or eight he said something that i thought was very wrong and i got i was really upset and i yelled at him he just turned into a puddle mm. uh, and i was and and my wife got mad at me for yelling and then we went into that family meltdown mode where nobody talks and just walks past each other for right. a couple hours mm -hmm. uh, and then it was bedtime and i said so i laid down with him as we used to do and read a story and i said son i'm so sorry about what happened you did something i think was wrong but then dad's response was very wrong and I was, I want to apologize. I want to tell you, I'm sorry, we're in this together. And he said, dad, would you be quiet? And I said, why? He said, I hate it when you're nice. So, I, <laughs> so I'd like to think that I was working on that conscious parenting, even, you know, uh, 25 years ago. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. And you were talking about that earlier. It made me think of uh, pause, assess, and the choice is situational awareness and what is the situation and how we interact and react and they all say it's not the action it's important sometimes it's your reaction and so on but i've often said too though i feel bad for people that lose their temper or you know lose control or whatever because i've said many times there's some things you just can't say i'm sorry for you know the words are out there you can't unring the bell and so i feel bad that's why i think pause is such a great aspect of that and then assess and then as you say choose uh, choice and and it's just I've seen people that really lose it and it's 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 just unfortunate because the words were already out there and sometimes if you just take that moment to think about it how it's going to come across you might save yourself a lot of distress down the road and and that's where part of the tenant one of the tenets of parenting uh, we talked about you know it's not liberal it's not conservative to tell someone to pause yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It's, so that's, it's, it's very reasonable that's and in the book, in the book, I use the example of a mother that picks up her child from school, goes to the drive through because the child's thirsty and picks and gets a drink and turns it, hands it back to her in the back seat and says, don't spill this. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, two blocks later, mom, the drink spilled. Uh, and I use the example where it's because of the way mom made one turn, knocked the book bag into the drink and knocked the drink over. Mm hmm. So the pause in this situation is to find out what indeed was this, what were the circumstances that happened? Right. Was right. it negligence of the child or did mom put the child in a situation yeah. where it could have happened because not because of the child, but just because the child was there. So pause, assess and choose. And again, if you make the right choice, great. But if you make the wrong choice, just be able to take that step back. Right. Whether that's that eat that morning, that afternoon, the next day, the next week, and say, you know, that didn't go so well. And then go to your trusted partner, whether that's your spouse, your friend, you know, your your parents, your sister, your siblings, somebody that you can say, you know, this interaction last week didn't go so well. And this is what I did. What are your thoughts on this? Well, and I think your example with your son. Uh, is just fantastic. I mean, we're still, we may be parents, but we're still human beings. And for you to say to him, you know, I didn't appreciate what you said, but I didn't handle it well either. And he said, oh, you know, I don't like it when you're so nice. But that, I just think that's fantastic because I'm sure there's many a parent that uh, are never going to admit that they're wrong. And the child is always, it had nothing to do with me taking the turn too fast. You didn't take care of your drink, you know, or that kind of thing. And so it's, I, I think it's neat when you, as a child, when you really see your parents are human. And they show that there's a, sort of a vulnerability there, which is just is really neat. I think it serves people well later in life. And I know as a parent myself is is I've always tried to say, look, I'm not perfect. I'm just doing I'm doing the best I can. And I hope I can always improve and learn from yesterday, but I'll still make mistakes. And I think a child really appreciates that. I think you said a key word there is there's there's power in vulnerability. Yeah. Um, and our society doesn't like to acknowledge that. Oh, that's so true. Um, that's, that's, vulnerability is seeing weakness, weakness and you have to be right. tough and, yeah. and vulnerability is never a word you're you'll hear a politician utter 
Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. That's really a shame because it is associated with weakness. And so, well, listen, we've got to wrap up and I just, I want to go through just a couple other little tidbits here. And then I have one last question for you, but I really liked uh, a number of things, all of this, but uh, some of the things that stood out, the, I am the problem. I am the solution. I am the resource. And I think you mentioned vulnerability. I think another thing that we have a problem with in our society is we don't tend to accept responsibility really well. And it's somebody else's fault. And I think that sometimes we move towards it. It's not me. It's always somebody else. So I am the problem. I am the solution. I am the resource is pretty cool. And then, of course, I love the five steps to community improvement. Uh, learn to be the best parent you can be. Number two, get involved, i.e. The, like the community, stay involved and sustain it. Uh, love for others, number four. And number five, forgiveness. And and uh, you mentioned Tuesdays with Maury, and I think I could do a whole podcast on forgiveness alone because that's such a, a great subject and such a challenging one for many people. So I always thank you again so much for being on the podcast, Dr. Bob. And I, I always end up my podcast with the same question for everybody. And so you will be no exception. And that is, is you get to pick one thing. And, and what do you know today as you're sitting here talking to me that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you? The process of forgiveness. Mm. As we just discussed. Yeah, as we just discussed, because that has been key. And again, um, uh, was very bitter with my father uh, mm. and uh, the issues. Uh, I mean, I almost died at one point when my father in a, one of his drunken stupors was driving my brother and I on a back country road outside of Chicago. And he was, I don't know how we didn't end up dead. Oh my goodness. Uh, and so uh, learning how to forgive, learning the whole process. And it has been a journey. I've made, worked very hard on that. And I think we need to remember social forgiveness. Yeah. And that's, sort of, we are the problem, we are the solution, we are the resource. Mm -hmm. So we can not just forgive a person, but forgive a group. Yeah, yeah, great, great point, great point. Excellent, well, thank you again. And so for all you listeners and viewers, just a couple of reminders. As I mentioned earlier, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, or Google. And please give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. And I know people that are struggling with a lot of life issues. And I have a program that I offer for my podcast listeners called my Gratitude Coaching Program. And what that does, it gives you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey, this is that you want to change, and this is a great program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, all combined to ensure your personal success. And for my podcast listeners, you get four, you get four your four-month gratitude coaching program, you get two months extra of being one of my listeners, which is a bonus for being on the podcast and listening to the podcast. So, and also, if you'd like to get my Monday morning minute, every Monday morning, I send out a 60 second video on gratitude. It's a different subject every week to get your week off to a good start. And it is 60 seconds, as I said, and you go to your text and you text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828 for the number. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and it'll give you a link to sign up and get the Monday morning minute. So lastly, thank you so much for tuning in. We wouldn't be anywhere without our listeners and our viewers. And I so appreciate it. And remember, it's always so important. I'm that gratitude guy to remember to be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.